Hey guys, this is Dreadnought from Temple Storm, and today I'm going to be going over a replay that was done during the ESL Finals for NA. It was uh, us versus Tuark in the Losers Bracket Finals uh, on Ch Sky Temple, and what it is is I'm largely going over it because there was a lot of points where we looked like we had a convincing lead, but we ended up actually making a lot of mistakes and a lot of weird decisions. Whereas Tuark made a lot of smart decisions against us in the process, even though the game kind of looked like it was semi-lopsided. And just going over and breaking down why we made some of the decisions we did, what decisions we made that were good, which ones did we make that were bad, and which ones could have come to bite us in the ass if the game was, let's say, on a more even playing field than it was. Um, so this is the first game right before the reverse sweep. And there isn't much more to it other than a really uniquely played game. Um, I don't think we should have won as convincingly as we did, judging by a lot of the mistakes that we make here. And I hope to point these out to you in the game. Alright. So there we go. We got two arcs spawning on the left side, us spawning on the right side. There's nothing to interesting about this, but what one thing that we need to consider from the very beginning is who has the stronger level 1 composition, and it comes down to us, largely because we have Diablo, Jaina, and Tyrande, which means Sight should be something we highly prioritize because they have very little kill potential, whereas we have a lot. The temple opens in 10 seconds. So what they're going to be looking to do is just sit around and get in their lanes and their advantage within their lanes and the position on it, whereas we're going to be looking for sight and hopefully getting a pick here. They do exactly that. They don't show at all, which is a smart decision on their part because we have the higher kill potential. What we do now is then send Uther to the top lane and then have our gank squad, which is going to be Diablo and Taranda, moving around trying to look for a kill. And we end up isolating Brightwing on the bottom half of the map, largely because she has the greatest kill potential. Well, we have the greatest kill potential for her. She has very little uh, escapes and is very susceptible because of her low health pool to a gank, so we're going to try and look for her. One of the interesting things here is, by looking for this gank, we have KO come up and take out this uh, ward. And that is a really good thing, it allows our team to loop around and try and get a kill from the bottom half. But one issue with this decision is that it could actually be telegraphing the gank. We Brightwing already is playing defensive, she went scouting drone, like she knows that she is susceptible to this gank. And so by playing aggressive with KO early on, especially because Brightwing is a pretty decent 1v1er in the early game especially, uh, kind of maybe makes it seem too obvious. It feels like we're telegraphing our gank here. It's not a poor decision because she placed it so aggressively, but it is one to consider when you're trying to get a gank squad set up. As we just move him a little bit too far forward to try and remove this. And the mid lane, it's a standard matchup, and the bot or top lane, it's a pretty standard matchup. But what we end up doing is uh, get the loop around on her without her seeing us, and that's really beneficial for our ganks. We end up just comboing her and getting a free kill, which is exactly what we like to do in the first place. So this is really beneficial for us. Our gank squad's working out, we're getting the picks in the places we need and want, and that's exactly how we want this early game to be going for our composition. Alright, Temple spawn, Arth ends up going top, we know we want to gank top, and by Arth showing there, we telegraph our gank on Quibsy. It's not that big of an issue though, because he gets the slow, and we end up getting the combo off anyways. Doesn't matter, get the kill. So the important part now looking at the game here, is largely that we have a man down for 5 seconds, Quibsy. Which means we should be trying to get an advantage for at least the 5 seconds that he's dead, and then the remaining, we'll say, 5 to 10 that it takes him to walk back. We should be working on dominating a temple, and then whenever he spawns, then rotating accordingly to him uh, and where he goes. So we do exactly that by sending me on the top lane. We have Toronto soak mid, or top. We have Arth go mid, but he ends up overextending by himself to where he gets gibbed, and that's going to hurt us later on. So now we're dominating the top temple, and the reason why this is a good thing that we were on the top temple before they were on mid, and we're half contesting now, is if you notice, ours is down to almost half the shots, whereas theirs is not even through 25% of theirs. 
And the reason this is important is because when we finish our temple early on, if we beat them on finishing it, which it looks like we will, that allows me to rotate down to them and end up forcing a fight here, which gives us an advantage. Um, we'll be ending up getting more XP out of the top shrine and then contesting the middle one as well. So as long as we don't go too ham here, uh, we're going to be alright. We have Hearth clear the midway, this is really good. It's going to force one of them to rotate, Quibsy rotate, to try and make sure he maintains the XP there. This is really good, this is really good. And we're going to keep maintaining Diablo, soaking the top lane XP. This is perfect. We're getting every lane of soak, and we're maintaining the domination on top. So now we've finished the top shine, and now we need to be looking to contest the middle. The minute I start rotating down, we already play aggressive. Notice how we've moved on to the actual temple now. That's a perfect play here. As long as we don't get instigated by any means, and we wait. There we go. I'm in range, we get aggressive. We pick on Quipsy here, and we have a uh, Nazebo rotating from the bottom here. Trying to get kills, trying to get kills. He flanks around to try and get more. We end up stealing the burst and getting quite a bit of damage, and we should have finished another kill there if our focus fire was good. But either way, it's a huge benefit for us. We now have a whole level lead, and it's really solid that we end up uh, getting this head on Sky Temple because the map is generally pretty snowball-y, especially during the second shrine rotation. So what we do here is then look for more ganks, Brightwing being the most susceptible again, but we have a scouting drone here that nobody sees. So we telegraph the gank and we don't get anything out of it because of that, and it takes us a little bit here before we actually manage to find it. We are blessed by the light. So this is an interesting situation here that I want to pause and talk about. Um, we're going to spend a lot of time, actually I can play it, we're going to spend a lot of time in this area looking for ganks back and forth while Quibsy and Panucci and their team is trying to react to our ganks. Um, so they aren't doing much, but neither are we, and we're the ones with the lead here. So um, it's really questionable what we decide to do here, because typically you want to be working on your bottom objectives like giants and then rotating to the upper half. So since the shrine's going to spawn on the lower half this next rotation, we want to be capturing knights at the same time, so then we split pressure on the upper half of the map while we're capturing the bottom and it's pushing for us. And the reason why that's really good standard play, but not only like that, in this situation it's a great play, is because we concentrated the upper temple, which now means the front wall is down and the fort is now really weak. So if that being a thing and our pressure that we could be applying to the upper half of the map is going to lead us to almost get this fort 100%, if not very, very close. And that's like a double win if you can get the bottom shrine at the same time. But what we're doing here is we're spending time trying to get a gank and a pick rather than worrying about the objectives. And what this is doing is just essentially if every lane, if the team behind is going on a three lane soak and so is the team ahead, the team behind is then catching up to them. So we're actually not pushing our lead far enough by trying to get these ganks that while we're pushing all our lanes forward. So we end up very unsuccessful on the ganking during this whole period of time and we end up lacking on our objective pressure. So once we realize that we are kind of behind on that, we end up rotating to it, but at this point it's going to be a little too late because we're going to capture giants but not have enough time to rotate to knights, and knights are the power play here because of the weakness on the upper temple, or on the upper fort because we concentrated the first top temple. So this hurts us quite a bit. We went from a full level lead, we're sitting at about 80% to 75%, so it's not that bad, but in reality, you always want to be trying to push your lead accordingly, uh, as far as you possibly can. Uh, Quibsy overextends and we do get the pick here, which helps us on the next shrine, but it's still questionable as to whether or not that has more value than getting these top knights here. One kill and a little bit of a shrine, or a top fort for almost free, forcing Brightwing to stay up there longer. It's a it's hard to actually point out, but it's definitely which one's better, but it's definitely something that should have been considered more while we were playing this game. We take their giants here because of that pick, and that's now a colossal play for us. Um, by doing this, we now they have to clear both of these out while we cap bottom shrine. And we're sieging at the same time, which means now our, we're getting more value out of the temple while capturing the temple while being a level ahead. The pick plus that cap ended up helping us an extremely high amount. 
So we so see that they are bailing and they're rotating to soak other lanes. I'm on top, so I'm matching their soak. They just cleared mid soak. And what they do is they push the wave as hard as they can and then harder rotate down below. And this is going to end up being a really smart rotation on their part because we end up moving Arthalon towards mid lane to try and capture the soak, which now sets them in a 4 versus 3 scenario with a Brightwing teleport. So in reality, it could be a 5 versus 3, and that's going to hurt us. They sight and they realize that we're down men, and we realize we're down men, so we back out as soon as we can. We drop the rotations from me and Arthalon, and we come down to force the 5 versus 5 with our advantage as fast as we can. Now this is going to lead to a really solid team fight, probably the first of the actual game where it's a 5 versus 5, and there's going to be two things to note. We're going to have Glarong shifting in really deep here, and we're also going to have Ko and me rotating around to the left hand side. And this leads to one of two outcomes, uh, which I'll play over here in a second. Ko gets relatively weak, Glarong moves in deep, and now they're splitting. We're moving from here with these three, and we're moving from behind them with the other two, which is a pretty good situation, especially if you have a large advantage. But since we're not 10, this is actually still pretty close to an even playing field. So the mistake is having KO being so isolated leads him to being able to take a lot of damage, but by flanking this way, it also forces Chubbs to move in too deep, and we isolate him as well. They split for KO and we split for Chubbs. This is essentially going, trying to go one for one. The difference is, is Chubbs is their healer and can't heal himself very much to survive, and I'm with KO to be able to make sure he maintains uh, surviving. So they go on him, and they like go all in for KO, but we keep him up, and then they leave Chubbs to just get destroyed by the Jaina. So we end up going one for nothing. Uh, in that situation, and now we've hit the 10 mark, which means now we can win the fight no matter what. Like, we've got this team fight. The Lightning Breath and Starfall. They end up getting away, but it forces them out completely. We realize we have the 10 advantage here after capturing, capturing. And we rotate mid, or to boss, to force the boss because they can't contest because of our 10 advantage. This is a smart play because there's not much else to do. We're all in the area and we can get it for free. Uh, they can't do anything about it. But the reason why that play ends up becoming more valuable than it should have is largely because the defense that's going to be sent out by two arc here. They're going to dedicate two individuals to clearing this boss when it's a six minute boss on Sky Temple is very weak. It would be almost impossible for it to take out like even a front wall here, let alone both the turrets. So they dedicate a lot of resources in order to clear it, which then allows us to get more dominance on the other parts of the map, whereas this boss wouldn't be very effective even if it was just left alone. It's kind of useless. We end up rotating to knights here, taking these, which is pretty good. Uh, nothing else on the map to really take at the time. Look at this boss, like it just got to the front wall and it's like whacking at it, barely doing anything. It's very weak. Okay, so we realize they're reacting to boss and we want to be trying to forcing, force something somewhere else. That's the right decision and the right call to be making here. What we end up doing is having Nazebo soaking mid lane and they end up clearing the boss because they've dedicated so many resources and we force the push so late here that we end up falling behind in the rotations and they end up beating us because we took too long taking knights and we didn't react fast enough to them defending boss. So what we do is we overextend an attempt to try and get this, and we force a 4 vs 5 rotation. This is a really smart decision by 2 arc trying to force this fight as soon as possible. It's on an even playing field right now, and we're down a man, which is exactly what they should be looking to do. What they do though is they don't force it fast enough and allow KO to actually get with us in time and they judgment right onto Soldier. Uh, Soldier's a pretty good kill target, except for the fact that we have Divine Shield this game. So they're gonna dedicate a lot of resources to Soldier here, and he's just gonna get Divine Shielded and not really care. But the interesting thing to note is, look at where their three kill targets are, uh, Brightwing, Tychus, and Ch -ch -ch Vala. 
are all sitting very grouped with Glarung being right here. Um, so what is going to happen is they're going to make the mistake of trying to all in on Soldier here, Divine Shield saving him, and then we're going to end up getting a Dream Lightning Breath because they're prepping for their damage here, and he's just going to rip them apart. That's really poor Odin-ing. Uh, we need to like try and just like get on this as heavy as possible when you see an Odin do it in the middle of a team fight. Uh, the Lightning Breath was instant, Jaina moves in trying to get damage on the three. Like, those three being together is such a good deal. The fact that we move aggressive on that, knowing that, is really big deal. Soldier comes out with a Divine Shield, survives. We end up killing Furious D, and then killing Panucci, and we lose nobody. And that was largely because of the positioning of the damage in that team fight. really all out there trying to siege is going to be risky because they still have Odin up but we're trying to make something happen out of it should be able to get it now or we're going to back out oh we get another pick on Quibzy here which leads to more of a snowball effect and more capturing of objectives all right so the next series of temple shrines or oh gosh the next series of shrine shrine spawn and we need to determine what is the most valuable for them and what's the most valuable for us and which one is better than the other. So because we've already taken top fort and we've taken bottom uh, fort, it would, that means that both of the shrines are going to hit on mid and then they're going to go for the front wall. In reality, bottom is more valuable than top right now just because it's taken a little bit of damage, but it's not that much more valuable. Both are pretty even in value for us, so there's no reason to go for one over the other. For them, the most valuable is uh, going to be bottom, technically, but again, it's not by very much. So because of our advantage in almost hitting 13, we should be looking to pick a fight rather than trying to get one temple and trade one for one. We should try and force them to have a hard time to cap rather than us just being okay with going even. We see that they start to rotate down bottom here. And we should be trying to match. We had Jaina take a couple shots on top, clear the wave, which is alright, and now we rotate down. They instantly know they're at a 13 tier disadvantage. So we got a free few shots on top, and we're gonna end up taking the bottom shrine here. This now gave us, in theory, the most beneficial temple and the least gave them the least beneficial temple but it also gave us a positional advantage because they were sitting on the lower half of the map here and we rotated to them and then they realized they couldn't fight and had to back out they're still working their way up to even start capping a temple we've already gotten shots from so what that means for us is we can start capping but then we can start pushing with it as well giving us double the value not double but more value out of our temple than theirs could ever give them They end up realizing this, starting to back out, using the global bright wing on top to try and maintain the temple. We push down the front wall. This is going to just barely touch the keep here, but it's still a pretty big lead for us in terms of structural advantage now. And the remaining of the temples are going to have really high value for us, start pulling out the keeps, which is exactly what we need. We are blessed by the light. So the light fades. We keep track of the timer of the next temple. We crab our knights. This is perfect. We still have a pretty big advantage. We want to be looking to force it appropriately, but not too hard. Uh, overextending for it. It's not big enough to just be able to face roll your opponent. We end up moving in for trying to pick a team fight here. Uh, Glarung is very, very separated here. If their team was faster to react, he would have a hard time surviving. Um, and that's one fight, again, where it's like, you can pick a fight, but if you go too far, it's going to really hurt your team. And it's lucky we have this big advantage, or that could turn on us very hard. They end up not having their team to react there either. But look at how much damage Glaring ends up taking. He consumes all of my heals, and he's still half health. 
and that's because of how far out he goes and that's the kind of mistakes you need to be really careful of when you have an advantage is when you want to fight but you can't always just force no matter how far away it is we get on trader here but we've already burned our Tron to stun so we have no combo they're gonna odin up and we should be looking to try and get damage on him while he's odining in the middle of the fight we see the odin here and glaring ends up getting a very big uh Lightning or er, lightning breath here because they're all standing still together and Odin's a pretty good target. Jaina moves in, landing her water elemental, and we're gonna be able to get a lot of burst out here on their team now. Quibsy gets beat over here by Arthalon. We end up taking out the Bala as well, and we're just surviving really heavily right now. Because of their positioning again, we were able to take a pretty big team fight, even though if that was in a normal situation where with the overextending that we had from Glarong, if their team reacted, if that was dead even, and that team fight was dead even, we could have very easily lost that team fight. But again, their positioning ended up with their disadvantage, make, like making more negative effect for them than it would be with our lead. So it ended up punishing them which allowed us to then take more of a snowball on this game, but when you really look at how we played that team fight, it could have been done a lot better. And this is another situation where we're nowhere ahead and we're trying to bite off more than we can chew, just like we did when trying to force this team fight here. Um, we have one person down on their team and we have a half health keep. We should be able to force it, but we don't have 16 tier advantage here. We do go to try and force it, which is perfect. The issue is we have different mentalities here. Soldier looks for a pick, while the remainder is looking for the keep here. And what this does is allows them all to react, and we start backing out before the keep's actually going to go down. So now we're going to get uh, damage from them, and then if he sp uh, Tyrael spawns, he's going to open with a judgment and be able to pick off our team. So we start backing out before we actually get the keep. We didn't all in it, we didn't do anything, we're just going to get ripped up. So what I end up doing here is sacrificing myself. I tell the team to go, but we don't listen very well. Um, and I'm just going to stay here, die for the keep, make sure it goes away, and keep four of us alive in the process. We stall in order to like, oh, can we save him? Can we save him? And it's not even totally sure if I should have sacrificed myself. It could have been possible that we would have been able to keep it alive, but it is questionable. And the one death for the keep is pretty worth it at this point in the game. But what the issue is, is largely because we don't have everybody on the same page when it comes to taking a keep and when it comes to taking like whether or not we're going to all in the keep or all in back out, just sacrifice me. Because we split our decision three different times in the past two minutes, it leads to us making minor mistakes, which if it was an even game, we could lose. We lose me here. That was expected because of the decision making, but now we're going to lose Vala to, or Soldier 2. This leads to them taking a boss. This is an issue, but not that big of an issue for us. We still have 16 tier advantage, and in reality, on again, as I said before, boss on this map is not that threatening, especially in the early to mid game. It's, what, 11.45 into the game. This boss isn't going to do very much for them. So what we look to do instead, which is very risky, when the temples spawn, is try and capture uh, a couple of shots on this and this could lead to one of our deaths and I'm surprised it didn't honestly and this is again trying to bite off more than you can chew. We should have been punished harder for some of our decisions here. We do have 16 tier now though as long as we regroup with all five of us we're gonna end up having an advantage for this team fight and ignoring this boss because it's pretty weak. It'll get this fort but that'll be the end of it. Um, so we're waiting for the spawns here. The minute we get everybody in range, we start moving in on it, and we force them off of it. This is perfect. Take a couple of shots here. We're gonna get some damage, but not very much, sitting here. And then we get the burst. We still have 16 tier advantage, so we want to be looking to force fights on objectives. 
that exists on their half of the map. So anywhere they go, we want to say, no, this is ours. We have 16 tier advantage. We're going to take it from you. We know where they're looking to go, and we rotate to their giants. We have Jaina come over again. We're going to force the fight. If they want any of these objectives, we're going to zone them off of it and take them. We do that perfectly here. This is smart play, and we should be doing this for every objective we know that they want to take right now. We know they went to knights, but we didn't think we had enough time to react, which we likely didn't, so we just went back to our giants. We take our giants and rotate and take our uh, knights as well. This is leading to a double giant pressure onto the core. They're going to have to react, which you see them do instantly. They're going to wait and send another for the second wave, and top's going to bounce out, but we'll have positional advantage because they spend time on the bottom half of the map clearing the giants. So we should be able to clear their knights here. Uh, before they can clear ours, meaning our knights will be the only thing left on the map. I know they're all on the bottom half of the map, so I'm just soaking an extra wave of uh, mid, so that because I'm safe and we can just get more and more XP than them as much as we can, get as much XP as fast as we can. They end up rotating mid trying to get a pick. I back out. And we think that they might want to move to contest site here, so we're hoping to get a pick here. Alright, temple spawn. Now the question is again, which gives you the most value? Bottom temple is going to shoot at mid, which already has lost a front wall, a turret, half a turret, and then it's got to keep another half a turret. Top temple is going to be almost a... F it's only going to take out half of the keep here, so bottom has far more value for us than uh, top does. So prioritizing bottom is a very big deal, and we only have a one level lead with no tier advantage here. So trading one for one is probably one of the better decisions we can be making. Uh, it'll give us a keep, it will get them almost nothing out of it, and we won't be forcing a fight that we don't have a huge advantage over. I like to do almost exactly that. Oh rip. I misclicked. Oh gosh, I messed up, boys. Microphone muted. Well, we're sticking with our line of sight then. Fog of war. So we grab the temple, uh, we're going to then get the mid keep here, which we knew was going to happen, and then we're going to try and threaten them off of top shine by pushing out the bottom half of the map here. They'd pull off the top shrine, but then they give up on it, and never mind, they rotate, and they go to pressure out top. This is good still. Um, it's not ideal because they catch up in a level, but in reality it leaves us to capturing another keep where they gain very little. We see that two are backing, but we know that somebody's still on top right now. So we try and rush up there as fast as we can, realizing somebody's up there, and we get a pick here because he isolates and stayed on the shrine too long. This staggered death here, by just getting a pick here at this point of the game, leads to then us to snowball even harder our advantage to trying to get to 20. Rip. So we're going to rotate down to their giants, deny them the opportunity to take giants here. And we're going to keep just moving on the map, moving, denying, moving, denying from them here. What I do here is we know where they are on the map roughly. We know that one's top, one's mid here. So we're going to try and stack these giants a little bit because we don't really have any threat of them taking it. So getting them closer together leads to their sieging being better. Otherwise, if we kept that earlier, they would have just cleared it and then laughed and then do it again. They end up clearing it anyways, but I mean, at least it's an attempt. It didn't hurt to try and stagger our giants to get them closer together here. 
He instantly rotate the boss with 20 advantage. This is a good play, and this is gonna help us out a lot here. Um, this is essentially the game winning play here. So, what we need to look at here is our composition versus theirs, and how well we can take a boss whenever, I guess, how well we can stay on cap versus how well they can. Tyria is one of the best characters to stay on top of a capture, whereas Diablo and Uther are also very good ones. Uh, to keep in mind, I have Divine Shield which means I can force anybody who's on it, which the number one strat usually is kill the person who's on the shrine, I can make them invincible. So what happens is they end up trying to contest as we get a lower here. And then Panucci does exactly what he should. He goes in, denies the capture point, stays on top of it. But the issue with that is then they're trying to focus me and Glarung down while we have Arthalon just burning Panucci with his burst. And now we've got me becoming invincible here, while Diablo's Flame Breath is hitting a lot of solid targets. So we have better burst and survivability than they do. Ends up getting me extremely low here. But I keep, uh, Glarung up as long as I can till the Tyrael Explosion. We've wiped two of them to our one, and the difference is two. My death would lead to me healing our teammates, and then also rezzing because it's post-20. So suiciding me and Diablo is one of the best because we both have essentially a resurgence here. So keeping us on top, we can't be killed, we can't be moved. Um, it's very hard for them to take a boss here, and the decision to do so essentially leads to them losing that game, especially with us having a 20 advantage. I end up going down, healing up the team. We get one more pick here. And then I heal up again and res, and then you can just push to win the game. Arthalon goes here to stop Quibsy's back. Smart decision, as long as we don't chase too far. It allows nobody to really defend other than the Tassadar. We all in the core here, and it leads to us winning the game. Um, ultimately, the decisions and rotations that we made this game were pretty weak, um, and Tuark out-rotated us at a lot of points. Uh, we team fought a bit better and considered our advantages, it seems like, a little bit better at moments like, for instance, that boss. Um, but ultimately, this game felt like it got out of hand for a period of time, but it was still really close because of our mid-tier decision-making at certain points uh, and not fully committing as a team or half committing as a team, for instance, to the bottom keep. And so points like that... Or just if you're looking to start a team or looking to play competitively or analyze the game better and everything else, that's stuff to look at. Um, uh, even if you're winning a game, how can you win it better? And we definitely, looking even at this game, have a lot of points. We could have played it better. All right, guys, everybody, thanks for tuning in. And uh, hopefully you guys get my next analysis video um, and see you then. All right, bye.